This evening, of course, we're getting into the book of Isaiah, and uh, we're going to cover the first 14 chapters of the book of Isaiah here this evening. Isaiah's name means the eternal is salvation, and that name ties in very closely with the subject matter of Isaiah's writing. Isaiah makes very plain that God will permit no uncleanness in his covenant people, but that he will punish the iniquities. However, God will also restore and bless Israel uh, following their national repentance. So the book of Isaiah uh, deals with this. It is one of the most messianic books of the Old Testament. In other words, it is a book that focuses in on the prophecies of the Messiah, the prophecies of Jesus Christ. The most de- detailed prophecies of Jesus Christ, both in his first coming and what will be his second coming, the most detailed of those prophecies are contained in the book of Isaiah. and We will notice them as we go through. The, there is a continual contrast that is drawn in the book of Isaiah between God's punishment on the one hand for various evils and on the other the ultimate restoration and glory that will come when the Messiah appears. So is, there is this contrast uh, that is being drawn, that is being uh, developed and, and explained as we proceed on uh, through the book of Isaiah. We'll notice it as we go through. Now, the backdrop of the events there in Judah the time and place and circumstance in which Isaiah was writing, provide uh, a, the the events there provide a, 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 a a backdrop for the the prophecies and the details that he goes into. The, um, the events that were going on in Israel, Isaiah lived in Judah and wrote in Judah, but uh, some of his ministry overlapped the closing days of the kingdom of Israel, the northern kingdom. He ultimately went into Assyrian uh, captivity. The, uh, the events were, of course, that the sins uh, of the nation had been continually worsening, and God was going to use Assyria uh, to chastise the people. Assyria conquered northern Israel during Isaiah's ministry, and it took them into captivity. Most of Judah's territory was occupied at a little later time. The Assyrian armies had come in, you see, and they had conquered northern Israel around 721 B.C. There was a period of deportation of the northern Israelites that continued over a period of about the next 20 years. There was the invasion of um, Judah that took place, that is described in the, is taking place in the 15th year of Hezekiah, which was 701 B.C. And uh, this, uh, this invasion that took place that threatened to take Judah into Assyrian captivity at the time. And Hezekiah's uh, going to God and God's miraculous deliverance by wiping out the Assyrian army camped around Jerusalem, put a stop to that. Um, Isaiah brings out, however, the ultimate fall of his own nation, and the backdrop of crisis in his own day, his own time, served to set the stage for the prophecies that relate to our day. Isaiah laid continual stress upon the fact that the destruction, that beyond the destruction the people could see lay, Ahead lay ultimately the salvation of God, the only hope of Israel. And so throughout the book of Isaiah, there is this thrust, there is this emphasis on the fact that that God's salvation is the only hope of Israel. The only hope that there is. And in order to set the stage for the fact that this is the only hope, Isaiah emphasizes and describes at various points, the sins of the nation, the punishment that will come upon the nation, but then the fact that that's not the end of the story. 
There is a salvation that lies on beyond. But Isaiah also has to demonstrate, and one of the reasons he goes into some of the things that he does to the extent that he does, is to demonstrate the fact that Israel needs something beyond itself to save itself. Let's look at a brief outline here. Chapter 1 is an intro, is a, a sort of an abrupt introduction here to the book of Isaiah. In the book, in chapter 1 of Isaiah, the nation of Israel is indicted for its sins. It's indicted as a sinful nation which must receive God's wrath. Then, uh, chapters 2 through 5, we, we start out here with a picture of Christ's millennial rule, which begins this section, and then there follows a detailed indictment of Israel's sins as a society and a prophecy of captivity and destruction. So we start out with kind of an introductory indictment uh, as God introduces the subject in chapter 1 through Isaiah. In chapter 2, uh, he focuses in on the way it will, the story will end up with a, a brief description of the millennial reign of the Messiah. Then he proceeds into a very detailed indictment of the sins of the nation and the captivity that will come, the destruction that will come. In chapter 6, we then go back and pick up the story of Isaiah's calling. The first five chapters really are introductory material that set the stage for what the prophecies of the book are all about. In chapter 6, we go back and we pick up the story of how God called and began to work through Isaiah. In chapters uh, 7 and 8, we have a prophecy that God would help Judah against a combine of Israel and Syria. As well, we will notice, uh, we get there into a prophecy uh, ultimately of the... Uh, th that event is used as a backdrop of prophecy of the Messiah and a prophecy ultimately of even the canonization of the Bible, of the New Testament, by the disciples of Jesus. We will notice those prophecies as we go through. Um, in chapters 9, 10, 11, and 12, uh, Christ's coming is prophesied, uh, God's use of Assyria to punish Israel, then his redemption of Israel and his punishment of Assyria, and the establishment of the government of God. These events are, are detailed in sequence here. Uh, chapter 13, we have a description of the uh, uh, destruction of, of Babylon, which is prophesied, which really is a type of the ultimate future destruction of Rome. Uh, it, it is paralleled in Revelation chapter 18. And in chapter 14, where we'll end up this evening, we have the description in the beginning of the chapter of uh, the house of Israel restored to prosperity during the millennium. Uh, we culminate uh, that chapter with a section that prophesy or that describes of the origin of Satan the devil. Now, let's notice here as we begin to go through Isaiah chapter 1. This is the vision of Isaiah, the son of Amoz, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem in the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. We have a time span here of about 60 years. A, time, a lengthy time span of Isaiah's ministry beginning uh, quite a ways back. Now, the prophecies that he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Jerusalem really is used to typify the entire nation, to, to typify Israel as well, because Jerusalem was the only city that was ever, it was the only combined capital of Israel and Judah. So it is, the prophecy deals not only with Judah, but it deals really with the whole uh, nation, all of the tribes of Israel. And Jerusalem is used symbolically to, to represent all of the tribes of Israel because Jerusalem was the focal point, the center place, this was the city from which David reigned as king, from which Solomon reigned as king over all the twelve tribes. 
So Jerusalem is used symbolic in a symbolic way. We uh, uh, use terms like that even in our modern terminology. Uh, today on the radio, you know, the statement of, uh, made about the arms talks and said, uh, you know, Moscow's response to Washington's proposal. Well, what do you mean, Moscow's response? Uh, that is the capital city of the USSR, and it the name is used to symbolically refer to the whole nation or to the government of the nation. When they say, you know, on the news that Moscow responds to Washington's proposal, uh, they're talking about the city of Washington in a symbolic way of symbolizing the government of the United States. They're not talking about George Washington. Uh, you know, he's, uh, he's not making any proposals now. Uh, it, we use some of the same terminology. So when you see Jerusalem referred to in this way, it is used symbolic in a symbolic fashion to refer to the whole nation, to the combined twelve tribes, to the uh, uh, to referring really to, to the whole nation. So Isaiah saw this over a period of time. And God begins with his indictment, and he compares here, as he says, he says, I've brought up children, in verse 2, and they have rebelled against me. The ox knows his owner, the ass his master's crib, but Israel does not know, my people does not consider. God says, my people don't seem to have as much sense as a dumb animal. You know, you ever you ever fool with animals? You ever, uh, uh, you know... A cow knows where the stall is, knows where the feed is. Uh, a cow's not too smart, but, uh, uh, you know, the, the uh, I'll tell you what, uh, we've got uh, uh, four uh, yearlings up there at my mother's place, and uh, there's a, a little feeding trough out there, kind of uh, out behind her house near the side of the fence. And all you've got to do, and those cows can be way over across the field where they can barely see you, all you've got to do is walk up there to the fence up there, that feeding trough, and kind of tap the bucket. And boy, they take off, one right behind the other. You know, they, they're coming. Uh, they, you know, cows not real smart, but they figured out, who, you know, where the food is coming from. Uh, they, they know where the source of it is. And so they come up there to the feeding trough. They, you know, they don't have any trouble. They, they, they got that figured out pretty well. God says, you know, the ox knows his owner. You know, the ass knows his master's crib. But my people doesn't know. They don't consider. God says, look, you know, I feed them. I take care of them. Here, I've taken care of my people. And they don't have as much sense as a, as an ox or a, or a donkey. Because at least these animals know who feeds them and, and where to go to, to, uh, uh, they know how to respond to their, to their master, to their owner. And my people don't seem to be able to figure that out. So, uh, you know, we, we pride ourselves on being very educated people and very far advanced. And, and uh, God says that, uh, you know, he doesn't think we really rank all that smart. We, we haven't figured out something that the, that dumb animals have figured out. Uh, he, uh, God says he's nourished Israel like children. He draws the analogy, you know, of providing for children. He, he says that, uh, draws the analogy that even an animal recognizes its owner in the way that Israel does it. And the, the consequence, you see, as he comes on down, verse 4, he says, Ah, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children that are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord, they have pr- provoked the Holy One of Israel to anger, they are gone away backward. Why should you be stricken any more? You will revolt more and more. The whole head is sick. The whole heart faint. From sole of the foot, even under the head, there's no soundness. But wounds and bruises, putrefying sores, they've not been closed up, neither bound up, neither mollified with ointment. You know, there's consequence. God says that the nation is sick from head to toe. He compares the nation. Now, you know, a sickness is internal. There's prophecies later on in Hosea where it talks about Israel seeing her sickness or Ephraim seeing his sickness and Judah seeing his wound. And at a later time when we get into that, we'll, we'll notice specifically, but a sickness refers to an internal condition. A wound is something that's externally imposed. Um, 
the nation is described as our nation, Israel. And remember that primarily when you see the term Israel, primarily it refers to Ephraim and Manasseh because when while the term refers in a general way to all of the tribes, uh, Israel, Jacob, uh, when he crossed his hands and laid hands on Ephraim and Manasseh, he said, let my name be named on them. And his name, Israel, was named on those boys and their descendants in a very special way. So prophetically, uh, the term Israel generally refers to Ephraim and Manasseh in a, in a specific way and in a generalized way to all of the tribes. Uh, so God's indictment is here of a nation sick from head to toe, an internal moral deterioration and decay. That is the condition that God describes. And then there is a consequence that's going to come from that uh, that condition. You see, first, God um, gives, he diagnoses the problem. So you're sick. You're sick from head to toe. And the, and the sickness is not uh, healing up. It's breaking out and putrefying uh, wounds and sores. And he says there's going to come a consequence. The prognosis, first you have the diagnosis, now you have the prognosis. He says your country is desolate. Your cities are burned with fire. Your land, strangers devour it in your presence. And it is desolate as overthrown by strangers. And the daughter of Zion is left as a cottage and a vineyard, as a lodge, in a garden of cucumbers as a besieged city. And except the eternal of hosts had left unto us a very small remnant, we should have been as Sodom, and we should have been like unto Gomorrah. Simply put, there's going to come a desolation on Israel as a nation, as a punishment. The destruction will not be total because God will preserve a remnant. A remnant will survive. But there is going to come... Uh, a devastation of this nation. And uh, this is described here. There, there is going to come this, this, destru- this destruction, this desolation, uh, this uh, massive destruction that is, uh, that is ultimately going to occur. And if it weren't for God's stepping in, there would not be anything left. So, God then, he compares our nation to Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, why do you think he would do a thing like that? You know, I mean, we've come so far uh, that in many of the major cities of this nation, uh, they celebrate with parades what they call Gay Pride Week. I suspect, you know, they must have had one of those in Sodom and Gomorrah. They they were pretty proud of things. Uh, there's not even a sense of shame. There's not even a sense of shame. It's like, you know, we do these things, and not only do we do them, we're proud of them. And it's just just absolutely incredible. I mean, you turn on a radio or television, if you've got a talk show and they're interviewing somebody, the chances are uh, they go very far, and here uh, is as commonly as not, uh, this character may wind up talking about, you know, some celebrity uh, talking about uh, his homosexuality. You know, that's how far we've come that uh, things like this are just openly talked about and discussed as though it's no big deal. Well, God compares us here, compares the, even the, the nation, you rulers of Sodom, uh, you people of Gomorrah, uh, and God says, uh, you know, what's the purpose of all your multitude of sacrifices? What are you going through the motions of religion for? You know, I'm sick and tired of your going through the outward form of religion. We call ourselves a religious nation. And uh, let's notice verse 14 because it's often taken out of context and misapplied by a certain one, certain Protestants who uh, say, well, see, uh, God hates the Sabbath and, and the holy days and you shouldn't keep them. Notice what God says, verse 14, Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hates. They're a trouble unto me, I'm weary to bear them. Now, number one, he didn't say my appointed feasts and my Sabbaths, my days. He said yours. Now, there's a difference between the ones that God says belong to him and the ones that he says belong to the people. 
you know, who, whose are they? Who's, uh, whose days does God hate? Does he hate his own? That wouldn't make sense. God says, I'm going to give you these days, but boy, I sure hate them. Uh, well, what sense would that make? You know, the problem wasn't, the problem wasn't with God, the problem was, was with the people. Two problems. One, in some cases, they substituted in their own festivals. You know, we have that. Northern Israel did that right after they rebelled against Solomon. Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, changed the festivals. Changed the, the, uh, the feast from the seventh month to the eighth month. So, they introduced their own festivals, in some cases, as a substitute for God's. And in other cases, when they held on to the outward form of of the day that God had set, they didn't celebrate it the way He said, and it was a matter that they had come to the point, as it's described here, of going through the motions of religion, but there was no substance of the heart. You know, for that matter, we can we can come to Sabbath services every week and, and warm a seat, and we can go through all the motions, and we can do everything the Pharisees did. And you know, God's not impressed with that any more than Christ is impressed with the Pharisees. You know, the point is, what are, what are we on the inside? Our, our religion is something that needs to be lived, and not something that is, is simply put on. God says, uh, you know, speaking of this, the, um, uh, he says, look, when you spread forth your hands, verse 15, I'm going to hide my eyes. I'm not even going to look. When you make your, your prayers, you go through all your prayers, I'm not going to listen. Why? Because your hands are full of blood. You know, you're going to have to clean up. You're going to have to cease to do evil. Verse 16, learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widow. God says you're going to have to repent. It's not a matter to go through the forms of religion. It's not a matter you get in trouble, oh God, please deliver us. If you're really sincere, then you're going to have to change your actions. You're going to have to start doing what's right. You're going to have to have an attitude of give and help and love and concern, not an attitude of greed and materialism and selfishness and, and uh, pride and vanity and violence. There has to come a, a change, God says, if you want me to listen. Coming on down, he describes the leadership and indicts the leadership of the nation. Verse 23, he says, Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves gifts and follows after rewards. They judge not the fatherless, neither does the cause of the widow come unto them. God says, you know, that sounds like the front page of the paper when it talks about the princes are rebellious. They're the, co- they're the companions of thieves. They all love gifts. And then he... Uh, you know, it's almost a, a badge of status uh, if, a, if, a, if a state official in Louisiana hasn't at least been brought before the grand jury uh, to, to be investigated about something. I mean, it's like he almost doesn't have any status, you know. It, it's uh, everybody that's anybody at least gets called before the grand jury, uh, you, you know, and some of them get indicted and maybe uh, beat the rap, and occasionally, uh, we, we don't generally do it with state crime, but occasionally... Uh, you know, on a federal matter, they, they may even send them up to jail. We, we've got this coming out right now. There, there are about four United States senators that are being in, uh, that are being investigated. Uh, we're tied in to some big SNL uh, bailout that involved about a billion dollars of government money. It just so happened, of course, the guy that owned the SNL was the major contributor to each of their campaigns. Uh, you know, some of them are Republicans, some of them are Democrats. Didn't make any difference. You know, he. By one vote as well as the other, he wasn't a respecter of persons. Uh, it says your princes are, are the companions of thieves. This is the this is the crowd they keep company with. Well, you know, kind of sounds like front page of our newspapers. Kind of sounds like what you hear about, and what you read about. God says they're not. They're, they're following after rewards. They're not judging the cause of the of the fatherless, looking after the widow. They're not concerned about those who can't take care of themselves. You know, here here they, uh, on the one hand, they can vote themselves a massive pay increase and uh, turn around and be ready to cut the Social Security benefits taking care of the elderly. Uh, you know, ultimately there comes a day of reckoning. God's not impressed. You know, he just doesn't think that, uh, that some of the priorities are, are exactly where they ought to be. 
So God then begins to talk about what uh, is going what is going to happen. That uh, there is going to be uh, a destruction of the transgressors here in verse 28. Now, in chapter 2, after this kind of preliminary indictment where Isaiah sets the stage, now he goes into uh, prophecies of what is going to come. See, it's not just going to stay this way, and it's not simply going to end with destruction. Because what's going to happen is that in the last days, Isaiah 2, 2, the mountain of the Eternal's house is going to be established in the top of the mountains, and it will be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. The government of God is going to be established, and all the different nations, all the different groups and tribes of people are going to begin to flow up to it and say, we want See, what are they going to say? Verse 3, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Eternal, to the house of the God of Jacob, and He will teach us of His ways. And we will walk in His paths, for out of Zion is going to go forth the law and the word of the Lord from Jerusalem. God's going to set up His government here on this earth in Jerusalem. This is going to be the, the future capital. It's going to be worldwide in scope. That's what it says. Uh, that... Uh, uh, It's going to be established in the top of the mountains. All nations shall flow unto it, we're told, in verse 2. So the government of God is going to be worldwide in scope. It's going to be headquartered in Jerusalem. Uh, Ultimately, the different groups of peoples are going to come up. And uh, it's interesting, we'll see later on in the book of Isaiah that we're actually given a little bit of the sequence uh, in, in the order in which some people are going to start coming up. Because... We're going to see the way the government of God, and we're not going to get into it this time, but next time we'll begin to see the way in which the government of God is actually established. And and it's interesting because it even names specific peoples who will be among the first to send ambassadors out to Jerusalem and say, would you please come down here and teach us? We want some of these things. He's going to judge among many nations. He's going to rebuke a lot of people. You know, some people need to be instructed. Others need to be exhorted and admonished. And there are few that are going to have to be rebuked and corrected. Uh, you, you know, it, it is a matter that uh, depends on the attitude. You know, some are going to be willing. They just don't know and, and God instructs them. There are others that are going to be pretty self-willed and they, they're going to think they've got a better way. And God's not going to put it to a vote. There's not going to be one man, one vote. Uh, there's going to be one vote, all right, and the vote will be God's. Uh, you, you know, the, the ballot will be unanimous. Uh, because uh, man has proven and is going to have opportunity to further prove he can't govern himself. You, you know, if people are ignorant of the right way and you put it all together, then you just have collective ignorance. And, and what good is that? So, he's going to rebuke among many nations until they beat their swords into plowshares, their spears into pruning hooks. You know, neither shall they learn war anymore. God's going to put a stop to the war-making ability. And uh, he's going to put a stop to that. Then, as he sets the stage showing what ultimately is going to happen, uh, beginning in verse 6, He says, therefore, you have forsaken your people, the house of of Jacob, because they be replenished from the east, or full of divination from the east. You know, one of the first things that God indicts the nation is he begins to get very specific now. As he sets the stage in chapter 2 as to ultimately what's going to happen is God is going to set up his government, and this is the way it's going to work out. But, you know, what about right now? Well, uh, you know, why is God forsaking his people? Well, God's people aren't looking, the nations of modern day Israel aren't looking to God, they're not looking to the Bible. You know, they're looking to some crackpot new age movement, or they're looking to some uh, eastern mysticism, and they're looking to all kinds of of ideas and crackpot philosophies that, uh, you know, the so-called great wisdom of the east that uh, God is not impressed with. You know, frankly, a little common sense... uh, you know, they look at the nations of India and, and some of that area, uh, uh, China, and the, the, the nations that have produced the so-called great wisdom, the great philosophies of the East. And what have those things ever done for the East? I mean, some of the most poverty-stricken, uh, 
uh, superstitious, uh, uh, backward, ignorant areas on the face of the earth you find there. Well, what has it done for them? So we want to import it over here and say, boy, you know, we ought to get a little of that. I tell you, it's just, it's insane. And yet, this is what God says. And this is what we find. He says, verse 7, the land is full of silver and gold. There's no end to their treasures. The land, verse 8, is full of idols. They worship the work of their own hands. So we see, uh, you know, God indicts the nation for seeking else answers elsewhere than from the God of Israel in His Word. The nation is indicted for materialism and for idolatry. These are the things that are going to happen. These are the things that are happening. The materialism, the idolatry, the looking elsewhere for answers away from God, the God of Israel. And so, God says there's going to come a consequence in verse 11, the lofty looks of man are going to be humbled. The haughtiness of men is going to be bowed down. And the Lord alone is going to be exalted in that day. But when the day of the Lord of hosts shall come upon every one that is proud and lofty. And uh, he describes how that uh, they're going to be bowed down and men are going to be made low. And the Lord alone is going to be uh, exalted in that day. Uh, the uh, They're going to go, verse 19, into the holes of the rocks and the caves of the earth for the fear of the Lord and the glory of His majesty when he arises to shake terribly the earth. I'll tell you what, when the final earthquakes begin to hit, and it culminates in the, in the earthquake that occurs at Christ's return, which is going to be an earthquake of such mammoth proportion that it's actually going to reshape the topography of the earth. I'll tell you what, nobody's going to be strutting around as to uh, how, how great they are. You know, you let the forces of nature start shaking the ground right under you, and nobody is real impressed with himself about that time. You know, it just really has this uh, uh, this kind of humbling experience. And so God is going to get everybody's attention and they're all going to be humble. Because it's kind of hard to be anything else when the, the ground is uh, shaped and shaking. And, uh, you know, the most solid thing you know is shaking like a dish rack. So uh, God, God has a way of doing that, solving that. The uh, let's go on. He, he goes into details of of the condition of our own society, the state of society, and he talks about uh, you know in chapter three the, uh, an indictment of society, a lack of wise, competent leadership. You know, he, really, if, if, you, if you look, what what God describes is is uh, is a a lack of wise, competent leadership. In the nation, he describes uh, the a, a, a period of, of juvenile rebellion. He describes uh, women's lib, you know, a nation that is dominated uh, largely, a society that is largely dominated by haughty women. Uh, that's uh, uh, you, you know. Let's just notice here. And uh, he talks about the, the leadership, the mighty men, the, the judge, the prophet, the prudent. You know, these are passed away. These are gone. God says you're not going to have you know, the great, wise, competent leadership uh, that has been available at certain times of crisis in the past. Verse 4, I'm going to give children to be their princes and babes are going to rule over them by comparison. The people shall be oppressed, every one by another and every one by his neighbor. So we're talking about internal strife and civil strife and people uh, seeking to oppress one another and to gain selfish, greedy advantage. And so we're, we're looking at a society that is divided against itself. The child shall behave himself proudly against the ancient, the base against the honorable. So there is a breakdown in the structure of society. There is a breakdown of respect. And I think that is one of the most fundamental things that we see that has occurred in our society since the 1960s. It has been the breakdown of respect. And anybody who's been involved in the public school system uh, over a period of, uh, let's say, who has, let's say, a 25-year period of teaching uh, to look back on, uh, will will point that out and zero in on that as one of the major changes that has taken place in our society since uh, the, the mid-60s has been the, the absolute breakdown of respect. And when respect breaks down, when you lose the respect in society, 
of of whether it's it's those who are younger respecting those who are older, whether it is the for the structure of society, uh, for those who are in in leadership capacity and 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 the respect that others look up to them and and the 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 respectful interaction of people in society when when that respect begins to break down the entire foundational units of society begin to crumble and uh, this is zeroed in on the you know there's going to come a time and it's this part is not here yet uh, there is going to come a time you know right now uh, everybody and his brother is trying to be president. Believe me, before the end of this age, uh, there's going to come a time when they almost can't find anybody who wants to do it because uh, uh, they're going to say, look, you know, this whole thing is about, about to, to, uh, uh, to collapse and I don't want to be responsible for it. So, you know, there's going to come a time when, when uh, uh, the rats are going to be trying to desert the ship, trying to... Uh, to blame somebody else. The show of their countenance does witness against them. They declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. It was interesting. I was just driving here this afternoon. I was listening to a talk show interview. Uh, and and uh, they were interviewing this guy. And, and it started out. He was talking about uh, uh, how he was uh, uh, had uh, gone from being an athlete to, to being a dancer. And before they got very far, uh, he was talking about... Uh, his lover, and, and you know, when he came out, and all of this kind of uh, garbage, I, I wanted to pull over the side of the road and puke. I'll tell you, it just, uh, you know, they declare their sin as Sodom. They hide it not. There's no shame. There's no embarrassment. Well, I'll tell you, you know, you can just drive down and look at the movie marquees. I mean, we, we advertise it. We advertise it. Woe unto their soul, they have rewarded evil unto themselves. Verse 12, As for my people, children are their oppressors, and women rule over them. O oh, my people, they which lead you cause you to err and destroy the way of your paths. God goes on and He says, uh, uh, in verse 16, Moreover, says the Lord, the daughters of Zion are haughty, and they walk with stretched forth nets and wanton eyes walking and mincing as they go and making a tinkling with their feet. Therefore the Lord will smite with a scab the crown of the head of the daughters of Zion, and the Lord will discover their secret parts. And that day the Lord will take away the bravery of their tinkling ornaments about their head and all of their these various uh, ornaments and things, uh, you, you know, all of the various things that goes on. Uh, when he talks about the time of captivity, and uh, in verse 24, it'll come to pass, instead of sweet smell, there'll be a stink, and instead of a girdle, a rent, instead of well-said hair, hair baldness, uh, instead of a stomacher, a, a girding of sackcloth, and burning instead of beauty, uh, talking about the destruction, and in some cases, you know, perhaps even the results of, in uh, some cases, radiation sickness, and talks about hair falling out and things like that, just the, the destruction that is ultimately going to hit. God describes a society whose priorities are upside down. He describes a priorities where the structure of society has been displaced. God designed proper roles for men, for women, for children. Not roles of superiority and inferiority. God didn't create inferior people. God created human beings in His own image, but He created male and female, and God structured a proper and appropriate role for each. And each role, one role is just as important as the other. Try eliminating one bunch, you know, try eliminate all the men or eliminate all the women and see how long the human race stays around. You know, it's not that one is important and the other is not, but there is a different role. God established that society have a certain structure. The family is the foundational unit of the structure of society. But we have here a society that is based on materialism, a society where the structure is turned upside down, a society here that where the hallmark is pride and haughtiness. It's what goes on the outside and not what comes out from the inside. You know, it's a replacement of, it's, it's a substitution of the daughters of Jezebel in place of the daughters of Sarah. 
It is a totally different set of priorities and values. You know, what was looked up to, what was idealized, what was viewed as as proper and appropriate and as the ideal to aspire to has been thrown aside and replaced with something new. And God's not impressed. So, he goes on, as, as we see here. The... Uh, um, We come on down that uh, the um, um, talks about the the destruction and the consequences of some of these things uh, in uh, in verse four of chapter four. When the Lord shall have washed away the filth of the daughter of Zion and shall have purged the blood of Jerusalem, uh, that He's going to create uh, upon every dwelling place of Mount Zion. Verse five. And upon their assemblies, a, a, a cloud and smoke by day and the sh- shining of a flaming fire by night. God will bless the nation when he restores them, when the lesson has been learned. Chapter 5 goes on into description of um, further uh, what has happened to the nation. He says in chapter 5, verse 1, I'll sing a song of my well-beloved, a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. He describes uh, God's vineyard, in this case Israel, protected, uh, hedged about, protected, walled off, and protected from other nations. And uh, uh, then God says that uh, because the nation has not appreciated and valued what God has given, He's going to take away the hedge, verse 5. It's going to allow... You know, I think we have not fully realized the extent to which our nations, the nations of modern Israel, uh, the nations of Ephraim and Manasseh, have been hedged off and protected. You know, we're the only nations that have not been invaded by foreign troops. United States, Britain, Canada, Australia. We haven't, we haven't had foreign troops set foot on our soil. Start naming the other nations that have. You know, try to come up with one. You know, we, we, you want to look at, at, at Latin America? You want to look at the other nations of Europe? You know, why, why could Hitler not go beyond the, the English Channel? Why couldn't he get across? Why couldn't he get beyond? Why couldn't the Kaiser get beyond? Why couldn't Napoleon get beyond? Why hasn't anyone ever been able to get beyond since the last migration of Israelites in 1066 under William the Conqueror? And since that time, there's never been able to, to foreign troops have never been able to set foot on British soil. You know why? Why hasn't there been? You know, the only destructive war we ever had in this country was was the war uh, of between uh, our states. When the states of the north and the states of the south fought against one another, that that was a war so destructive that, that there were more American lives lost in that war than in every other war that we've ever fought added together. But those weren't outside forces. Those were forces right here uh, within the, the, the nation of Manasseh. So, you, you know, we, we haven't fully appreciated and valued what it means. Uh... To, to not have foreign troops on our on, on our soil, not having our land devastated. You know, Russia can't say that. Moscow was was burned and destroyed. Uh, you know, the, there was a tremendous loss of life, literally uh, running up into many many millions, literally tens of millions during World War II. I don't think we a lot of times recognize the devastation that Russia went through in, in the time of World War II. Great quantities of the area occupied. Uh, they had gone through the same thing at, at the time of Napoleon. Not destruction on quite as massive a scale, but the invasions. You know, nations like China, nations like Japan, nations uh, like India. You, you go, you know, around. Here, our nation, God says, you know, I've, I've put a hedge, I've put a, I've put a wall, but I'm going to tear that wall down. I'm going to open you up and let them come on in. 
Then he begins an indictment as to why is he going to do that. Verse 8, he says, Woe unto them that join house to house, that lay field to field, till there be no place. We haven't uh, uh, properly used the things we have, even the way we've built our cities. So God says uh, selfishness and greed has been the motivating factor. So God says there's going to come uh, captivity, or there's going to come famine. In verse eight, or in verse ten, it describes uh, ten acres are going to yield about three quarters of a bushel. So that's not very much. Uh, you're not going to stay in the farming business very long if you don't reap about three quarters of a bushel from. Uh, from ten acres of, of property. Woe unto them, verse 11, that rise early in the morning, that they may follow strong drink, continue until night, until wine inflame them. The harp, the vial, the tabret, the pipe, wine, or they're in their feast. They regard not the work of the Lord. You know, they're in partying. They're out abusing alcohol and various other drugs. Uh, they're, uh, you know, wanting to party away. That's what they want to spend their life doing. They're not concerned about the work of God. They're not concerned about doing what God says. Very descriptive. Therefore, verse 13, my people are are going into captivity. They're going to go into captivity. Verse 20, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil. They're on an upside down set of values. You know, verse 21, that are, woe unto them that are wise in their own eyes, prudent in their own sight. Woe unto them that are mighty to drink wine, men of strength to mingle strong drink. Boy, you know, the only, uh, the last of the big time boozers here. They really, uh, really belt it down. You know, their pride is in, is in how much they can, uh, manage to, uh, to put down before they, uh, somebody has to carry them out. The, the, this, this upside down set of values that, that, uh, that has produced the epidemic of uh, chemical abuse in this country. You know, this is, this is catastrophic. Uh, I think very descriptive term here that describes the legal profession. Verse 23, which justify the wicked for reward and take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. They're not out trying to find justice. It's an adversary system with each side trying to win. Back two or three years ago, I heard the interview of one of the most prominent criminal attorneys, criminal defense attorneys in this nation, uh, being interviewed, and uh, he was being asked about uh, you know his clients, and he just made po- point. He says, you know, I have seldom, if ever, defended a really innocent man. Uh, he said, my my job is not. He says, I'm not after justice. I'm out to try to get my client off. He said, That's you know, my job is not. To secure justice, my job is to win the case for my client. That's what I'm being paid for. You know, I don't have any apology for that. The DA is out trying to win the case for the state. He's not trying to get justice. He's trying to win the case for the state. I'm trying to win the case for my client. That was his his analysis. That that was his uh, what he had to say. God says, well, to them, to justify the wicked for reward, Take away the righteousness of the righteous from him. They're not concerned about what's right, what's just, what's equitable. They're out to do what they can do and to get what they can get. God says they're going to be devoured like uh, fire devours stubble. You ever, set, you, ever, you ever burned off a stubble field? A lot of you, you know, maybe you're burning off cane. Uh, you know how that, uh, you know how that fire goes. God says when I light the match. It's going to go like like fire through a stubble field. It's going to go because they've cast away the law of the Lord. Verse twenty four. They've cast away the way the law of the Lord and despised the word of the Holy One. So we we have a, a very descriptive area of describing kind of an overview of the nation. The greed, the corruption, the materialism, the breakdown of the very foundational forces that hold society together, the respect, the structure uh, that that ought to begin in the home and be reflected throughout all of society, the emphasis on on the the external, the materialistic, the uh, the, the things uh, of that God says are of 
are not of value in the in the long term, and the rejection of the true thing, of the things that really proceed from God. So God sets the stage, having briefly introduced in chapter 2 the fact that in the last days, the ultimate conclusion is the God of heaven is going to set up a kingdom. But he, he brings this in. Now in chapter 6, we, we finally, having set the stage, we come to the calling that Isaiah received. How that uh, in the day that King in the in the year that King Uzziah died, Isaiah sees this vision, and in vision he sees God sitting upon a throne, and he is overwhelmed with this, and he goes through uh, symbolically the things that that occur. He doesn't feel worthy. God uh, symbolically cleanses him in his vision, and then says, "You know, I've got a job to do." And Isaiah's response is in verse 8, Here am I, send me. And so God then says that He will. And uh, then He describes in verse 11, Isaiah asked the question, Lord, how long? And He said, Until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate. And the land be utterly desolate, and the Lord have removed men far away. There will be a great forsaking in the midst of the land, but yet it shall be a tent, and it shall return. There's going to come a captivity from which only a tent of our nation will return. God is going to save out a tithe we're looking at 90% destruction that will occur. And that, that is destruction on a scale that we cannot imagine or comprehend. We don't realize what is taking shape and what is occurring right now in, in the, the things that are beginning to shape up in Europe. God talks about in Isaiah 10, verse 5, O Assyrian, the rod of my anger, and the staff of their hand is my indignation. And this nation is blithely negotiating away, and we, we're talking about Germany reuniting. And will they stay in NATO or not? We're ultimately going to find out that a reunited Germany, uh, NATO is going to be the least of their concerns. And whether or not they stay in, is going to be the least of ours because uh, we're going to find that the Assyrian, God says, is going to be the rod of his anger. He's going to use the Assyrian nation, the modern day Germans, to chastise and correct our nation. And uh, that is that is going to occur. The things that God indicts, you know, a lot of our, uh, the things that God indicts in our nation, the things that God sees that he hates, and, and we have to look at these things, and as we go through and look at the indictments and see the things that God hates, what we need to do is to ask God to change our set of values from the inside out. We want to learn to hate the things God hates. We want to learn to love and value the things that God values. You know, in our lives as men, as women, as children, as families, as employees, as employers, as human beings, we want to learn to value and appreciate what God values and appreciates. And recognize the, the contrast between the values that are so common in our society. And you know, we live in the society and we're influenced by it and our children are even more influenced by it. And if we don't really uh, dedicate ourselves to, to really trying to, to fill our minds with a godly set of values and, and to instruct our children as to why the set of values that they see at school and on television and in entertainment and in all of the things around, why these are not the values to, to hang on to. Because there are consequences that are going to come. These things are destroying an entire nation. God then begins to go into, in chapter 7, a uh, uh, 
taking to begin with the the, destru- the the description of the alliance of Syria and Ephraim and the uh, the conflict that was taking place with ancient Judah at the time uh, uh, Isaiah was writing this and the fact that uh, uh, that that was not going to be a successful combine the Assyrians were going to uh, take into captivity uh, there was going to be a that uh, there were events that were going to happen that, that really, in a sense, foreshadow uh, events that would happen way on down. And uh, verse 14, notice the sign of salvation that God said. Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. A virgin shall conceive and bear a son. His name will be called Emmanuel. And this, of course, ultimately is a prophecy of Jesus Christ. This is is a uh, this prophecy is quoted in the New Testament, and. Uh, um, goes on and describes the uh, this is set into the context as the nation you see the context of the prophecy as the nation is looking at what they think is sure destruction you know they're looking at what they can see and the warning is here you don't base what's going to happen on what you can see at the time Isaiah wrote this Judah looked out and here's Syria here, here, northern Israel, headed up by the tribe of Ephraim, was making an alliance with the nation of Syria, and they were going to invade the Jews. And it looked like destruction was on the horizon. This great, this combine was going to come in and really uh, put it to them. But before any of that really happened, uh, here the Assyrians came in and, and uh, conquered the whole thing. The picture can radically change. Events can happen very quickly. And so Isaiah's message was, look, don't depend on what you see. God is the source of salvation. In chapter 8, he goes on talking here about, uh, about Assyria. And how that he is going to bring the king of Assyria in verse 7 into the nation and how it will pass through Judah, verse 8. Describes the destructive conquest and then begins to focus in on salvation in verse 13 after describing here the, uh, the invasions and the things that occur. Verse 13, it says, Sanctify the Lord of hosts Himself, and let Him be your fear, and let Him be your dread. Don't be worried and impressed with what all these other nations and people are going to do. Focus on God. He's going to be for a sanctuary, but for a stone of stumbling, and for a rock of offense to both the houses of Israel, for a gin and a snare to the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Speaking here of the Messiah, who was to be a stone of stumbling, a rock of offense. You You know, people took offense. Many are going to stumble and fall and be broken and snared and be taken. Verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. How's the testimony? You know, to the law and to the testimony. That is description of the Bible. You remember in the book of Revelation when it describes the saints of the Most High who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That expression is used two or three places. Uh, Those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. That is a description of the church. That's simply another way of saying the Old and the New Testament. The law, that is reference to the what we term the Old Testament. The testimony of Jesus Christ is what we refer to as the New Testament. To the law and to the testimony. Verse 20, if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. Ultimately, we look to the Bible, to the law and to the testimony. To the law of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. 
to the, to the Bible. Genesis to Revelation, to the whole book. How is it going, who's going to be responsible for putting it together? Well, in verse 16, bind up the testimony, seal the law among my disciples. So it was going to be among the disciples of the Messiah, the one who would be the stone of stumbling, that the this canon of Scripture would be completed. That's who sealed it up and finished it. Who gave us our New Testament, the disciples of Jesus. It wasn't the Catholic Church in conference or, or, uh, uh, or something two or three hundred years later. The only thing they ever tried to do was take it apart. It was already in existence when you read of the first church councils discussing it. The only thing they discussed was trying to get rid of some of the books that were in it. The law was, the testimony was bound up and sealed up among the disciples. We've gone into that, I think, before focusing in Peter and John specifically. Then he comes on down and says, I'll wait upon the Lord, verse 17. Verse 19, when you shall say unto them that seek, uh, then when they shall say unto you, seek unto them that have familiar spirits, unto wizards that peep and that mutter. You know, seek out astrology and seek out fortune tellers and all these things. Shouldn't the people seek unto their God? Why would the living go to the dead? Seances and things of that sort. To the law and to the testimony. That's where you look to the Bible. And if they speak not according to this word, it's because there's no light in them. The real test of a prophet is whether uh, someone who claims to represent God is whether he's teaching what the Bible teaches. To the law and to the testimony. Is he teaching the entire Bible? In chapter 9, uh, as we proceed on, talks about uh, uh, that... Uh, uh, Description here, a prophecy of, of the Messiah, that he would come, uh, come from beyond the Jordan and Galilee of the nations. In verse uh, 2, the people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, uh, upon them has the light shine. Uh, reference here, prophecy of Christ. Verse 6, unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, the government shall be upon his shoulders. Jesus Christ was born to be a king. Of the increase of his government and peace, there shall be no end. Upon the throne of David and upon his kingdom to order it and to establish it. Well, Jesus Christ is going to sit upon the throne of David when he returns. Description here, a prophecy of where salvation will come from. Of the Messiah. We know to be Jesus Christ. God goes on showing that the uh, the nation does not recognize its need for salvation. They say in verse 10, the bricks are fallen down, but we'll build with hewn stones. The sycamores are cut down, but we'll change them into cedars. We'll work it out. We'll fix it some way or another. God says in verse 14, the eternal will cut off from Israel, head and tail, branch and rush, in one day. The ancient and honorable, he is the head. The prophet that teaches lies, he's the tail. For the leaders of this people cause them to err, and they that are led of them are destroyed. God indicts the leadership for causing the people to err. He says those that are in the responsible positions, those that are in leadership positions, are causing error. They're not leading the nation in the right way. Then, in verse in chapter 10, verse 1, Woe unto them that decree unrighteous decrees, that write grievousness which they have prescribed, to turn away the needy from judgment, to take away the right from the poor of my people, that widows may be their prey, that they may rob the fatherless, what are you going to do in the day of visitation, God says. In verse 5, O Assyrian, the rod of my anger and the staff in their hand is my indignation. I will send him against a hypocritical nation. And against the people of my wrath will I give him a charge 
to take the spoil, to take the prey, and to tread them down like the mire of the street. Howbeit he means not so, neither does his heart think so, but it's in his heart to destroy and to cut off nations, not a few. You know, they, right now as they're planning German reunification, that's not what they mean in terms of the, of the destruction. You know, he means not so, neither does his heart think so. They don't really think at this point that they're going to do it again. But it's in their nature when they when they go to war to go to it with brutal efficiency. And they're going to do it. God says, you know, they don't realize what they're what they're up to right now at this point. And it's not necessarily what they're actively planning, but the circumstances are going to come about and, and Satan is going to stir them up and they're going to come and God is going to allow them to do so. He's going to remove the hedge. Remove the fence. He's going to allow the Assyrians to be the rod of his anger and to chastise and correct this nation in a way we have never experienced. He indicts us as a hypocritical nation. Then God is going to deal with the Assyrians after that. He... he, uh, says in verse 12 that uh, when it, wherefore it will come to pass when the Lord has performed His whole work upon Mount Zion and on Jerusalem, I will punish the fruit of the stout heart of the king of Assyria and the glory of his high looks. So God's going to use the, uh, uh, the Assyrians. He's going to use the Germans to punish us. He's going to turn around then and use the Russians and the Chinese to punish them. And then He's going to take care of them. So there's going to be a, a succession we're going to see as we go through the major prophets, the, the way and ultimately the battle that will actually be fought several years into the millennium that, uh, that will occur. The book of Ezekiel brings that out. But uh, there are events that are going to occur. And But in verse 20 of Isaiah 10, it says, It will come to pass in that day, the remnant of Israel and such as are escaped to the house of Jacob shall no more stay upon him that smote them. But they're going to stay upon the Lord, the eternal, the Holy One of Israel. You know, they're going to come back from captivity. They're going to learn a lesson. And we're told here uh, in verse 11, in chapter 11, verse 1, there will come forth a rod out of the stem of Jesse, a branch shall grow out of his roots. Speaking here, of Jesus Christ, who was born, the Messiah, born of the seed of David, David, of course, being the son of Jesse. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him, the Spirit of wisdom and understanding, the Spirit of counsel and might, the Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the eternal. He shall make him of quick understanding in the fear of the Lord, and he shall not judge after the sight of his eyes, neither reprove after the hearing of his ears, but with righteousness shall he judge the poor, and reprove with equity for the meek of the earth. And he'll smite the earth with the rod of his mouth, and with the breath of his lips shall he slay the wicked. The right and righteousness shall be the girdle of his loins, and faithfulness the girdle of his reins. He's going to judge in righteousness. He's going to judge with equity. There's going to have to be correction. There's going to have to be things straightened out. But notice the extent of change that is going to take place. The wolf will dwell with the lamb. The leopard will lie down with a kid, the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and the little child shall lead them. The bear and the cow will feed, their young ones will lie down together, and they'll, the lion will eat straw like an ox. Verse 9, they shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the eternal as the waters cover the sea. So when the knowledge of God is pervasive, God is 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 literally going to even change the nature of the animal. Going to literally change the nature of the animals. You know, God uses wild animals as a description of the way that many of the kingdoms of this world act. When he describes the great world-ruling Gentile kingdoms in the book of Daniel and later in Revelation, he describes them under the guise of wild animals. Built, or... or, uh, Animals that, that 
are out to, to take a prey out to devour and to destroy. To, to devour a prey. To, to, uh, he describes it under the analogy of lions and tigers and, uh, or lions and leopards and bears and, and this type of... Uh, uh, this is the nature that God says. You know, human beings act like a bunch of wild animals. And that very nature, even in the animals, is going to be changed to symbolize, to demonstrate that there is a different way of life. There's going to come a peace. There's going to come a rest, a tranquility. There's not going to be the danger and the harm. See, verse 10, in that day, there will be a root of Jesse which shall stand for an ensign of the people. In other words, stand like a flag that everybody can, can seek to. To it shall the Gentiles seek, and his rest shall be glorious. It really is. And it will come to pass in that day that the Lord will set his hand again the second time to recover the remnant of his people. The remnant of Israel scattered. from Assyria and North Africa and various areas. And he's going to set up, verse 12, an ensign to the nations, and he's going to assemble the outcasts of Israel and gather the dispersed of Judah from the four corners of the earth. And the envy of Ephraim is going to depart, and the adversaries of Judah will be cut off. And Ephraim is not going to envy Judah, and Judah is not going to vex Ephraim. There's going to be a peace that is going to occur because the nations of Israel will have learned a lesson. And when God begins to bring them back from the captivity at the end of uh, at the end of the captivity, the beginning of the millennium, they're going to come back in a humble and submissive and teachable attitude. God is going to destroy the tongue of the Egyptian sea in verse 15. And there's going to be a highway, verse 16, for the remnant of the people, ones coming from Assyria. And they're going to, to come up from Israel in the day that they came, as they came out of the land of Egypt. God is going to begin to bring His people back from that captivity at the beginning of the millennium. He's going to, He's going to gather them back by way of a highway. God's going to have constructed right through, you know, if you look at it, uh, it's going to go right through part of what right now see. There's going to be a highway to bring them down directly so that they can, they can come back. Chapter 12, very short chapter that uh, kind of, that ties in with this of praise to God. The time as it describes in verse three, of chapter twelve, when with joy they'll draw water out of the wells of salvation. The time when salvation will be opened up. So there is this description. God indicts the nation of Israel, uh, shows their sin, shows what he disapproves of what he disapproves shows the, the calamitous events that are going to occur, and then he shows the salvation that God holds out, the only source of salvation. Now he begins to focus in uh, here in chapter 13 on the uh, some of the nations that, are, that God used as a tool against Israel and what's going to happen to them. This is the burden of Babylon in chapter 13. He tells them in verse 6, uh, in verse 6, how you, for the day of the Lord is at hand. It will come as a destruction from the Almighty. This is the day of the Lord that is going to come. The day of the Lord comes after the tribulation. And it talks about the heavenly signs in verse 10. In verse 11, I'll punish the world for their evil and the wicked for their iniquity. will cause the arrogancy of the proud to cease. will lay low the haughtiness of the terrible. You know, I'll make a man more precious than fine gold, even a man than the gold wedge of Ophir. God will give a sense of priorities when all this is over with. People won't uh, place the value on material things. Uh, you know, people place a lot more value on material things than they do on other human beings. God says, when I get through, they're going to learn what's important. I'm going to shake, verse 13, the heavens and the earth, uh, it's going to be a day of fierce anger. Describes here the day of the Lord. Now, 
Speaking of the of Babylon, verse 17, he says, I will stir up the Medes against them, which shall not regard silver, and as for gold, they shall not delight in it. Now, the Medes are the nation, the Medes are settled in the area of what is now the modern day Ukraine, part of Russia, part of Soviet Union. The, uh, what you have is, you know, what we're going to see is the pendulum swings that take place. You see, right now, uh, there is coming a, into a greater European orbit of what is Eastern Europe, Central Europe, Western Europe. Uh, there is coming uh, a, a European orbit that is going to see certainly the inclusion of, of uh, many of the nations of what we've considered behind the Iron Curtain, nations of Central Europe uh, that we've tended to think of as, as, as the East, uh, the Eastern Bloc. Uh, we're even seeing uh, some of the nations that are constituent parts of the Soviet Union. And I, I think that uh, at least much of, of uh, Russia and some of the other nations are going to, uh, at least for a time, be allied with the beast power. Some of the nations of Central Europe will actually be part of it. I don't think there's any indication that Russia will ever be not one of the ten kings, but I think clearly uh, at the beginning, a very great likelihood they're going to be allied with it. It may be part of their nuclear arsenal that that winds up being used against us. You know, where's Germany going to get their, their, their nuclear arsenal? It's going to be in the con- it's evidently going to be in the context of a European defense force. Uh, you know, where, where's it going to come from? But the scripture shows that as events go on, there is going to come uh, a disillusionment, that there is a lack of trust between Germany and Russia that is going to involve a double cross. If you remember, World War II started out with Hitler and Stalin being allies. Stalin was Hitler's ally. That's the way he picked up Lithuania and Latvia and Estonia and a good chunk of Poland and part of Romania and part of this and part of that. That's where he got it all at the beginning of the war. He stole it at the beginning of World War II when he and Hitler were allies. They made a deal and split it up between themselves. Then Hitler stabbed him in the back. You see, Hitler didn't trust Stalin. And so when he thought he was in a position to do it, he launched an attack on Stalin. Catch him by surprise. And then, of course, Stalin launched his counter-attack on Hitler. It became bogged down as the Russian front, won by General Winter. That's the most formidable soldier the Russians have. Uh, You know, when it drops to 40 below zero, Things don't work very well. The mechanized equipment that the Germans have brought in froze up, literally. It's an interesting story if you read it. Uh, it is the, is the last successful use of horse cavalry in, in modern warfare. You realize that took place in World War II. Uh, it dropped, the weather dropped uh, 40, 50, 60 below zero. All the, mechani- all the mechanized equipment froze up. The Russians brought in uh, Mongol horsemen from Siberia, uh, and and uh, you know these were the Germans were on foot and about to freeze, and all their tanks and the lubricating oils all froze up, and the Russians brought in by train uh, these Mongol horsemen and all these uh, uh, these thousands and thousands of Mon- uh, of uh, Siberian ponies uh, from uh, Siberia. Well, those things uh, you couldn't freeze them out if you tried. I mean, uh, you know they lived for thousands of years in Siberia. They brought them in and all these Mongol horsemen and they hitched those horses up to the Russian stuff and pulled it around and they rode circles around the Germans. The Germans couldn't even get their guns to fire. The thing froze up. And uh, that's uh, what uh, that's what defeated Hitler on the Russian front. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing, you know, when everything, when technology freezes, go back, uh, when technology breaks down, go back to old faith. Uh, you know, there, there are things that... Uh, uh, that uh, survived. But anyway, you know, what, what did you have? You had the pendulum swing. You're going to have the same thing. You, you, basically, is what's going to happen. I mean, the first woe is Europe coming against uh, against Russia. The Germans and the Russians have never trusted one another. And they, they've never, uh, you know, they've worked together 
at various times in history, but th- there is something there, and, and there's a lack of trust. And the first woe is they're going to attack them. They're going to try to get a preemptive attack. The second woe is uh, they're not going to be successful. And, uh, you know, the Medes are going to come. There's going to be a backlash. You know, communism right now uh, is, is, being, is, is, is being phased out. See over there, uh, but don't think that uh, that everybody, all the hardliners and all that bunch, uh, are you know they all disappear. They're gonna they may fade from power, but you know what's going to happen when this newfound prosperity and this uh, you know what promises to be a success and linking up with the West when that turns to dust, you're going to have a pendulum swing and you're going to have. Uh, you, you know, an alliance of Russia and China uh, coming back, and it describes the Medes, which regard not silver, and as for gold, they won't delight in it. Uh, you know, there's going to be a, a revival, uh, a takeover there of, of the old hardline communists that are going to rise up and, and unite the whole Asiatic area of China and India, uh, and, and uh, dominated there by, by Russia. There's going to come, th- this is, you know, well on into the tribulation before this occurs. These are the events of the day of the Lord. These are the events in the last year before Christ's return when that, when that pendulum swing will swing back and, and they will come in and devastate Europe, devastate Babylon. The destruction that you read of in Revelation 18, the destruction of, of modern Rome, that's, you know, that's a nuclear devastation. That's who's going to do it. Um, and it describes there in verse 19, Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the beauty of the Chaldeans' excellence, shall be as when God overthrew Sodom and Gomorrah, it shall never be inhabited. Now that occurred to ancient Babylon, and it's going to occur to modern Babylon. Revelation 18 makes plain it's going to occur to modern Babylon, because Revelation 18 was written way after it had happened to ancient Babylon. See, that was already old stuff when Revelation 18 was written. Isaiah prophesied it. And it happened to ancient Babylon, but it's going to happen to modern Babylon. Revelation 18 makes that plain. Uh, chapter 14 shows the Lord will have mercy on Jacob. He'll yet choose Israel, set them in their own land, and strangers shall be joined to them and shall cleave to the house of Jacob. Um, and the people shall take them and bring them to their place, and the house of, J- of Israel shall possess them in the land of the Lord for servants and handmaids. They will take them captives whose captives they were and rule over their oppressors. You see, the way God's going to get the point across to those who were part of the beast power, uh, when Israel comes back, when Christ comes back, and, and all of this occurs, the, those, you know, who were the keepers of the concentration camps and whatever, they're going to come bringing these out. You know, here, you know, let us kind of dust you off and take you gently over here. They're going to be trying to, to do what they can to get out of trouble. And they're going to spend... Uh, the shoe is going to be on the other foot. They're going to start off and they're going to be brought back and they're going to be made servants. You know, everybody needs to learn to serve. And uh, so here is a group that uh, very possibly may even be for a generation, may even be until the time of the first jubilee that uh, the people of the beast power are brought back to Israel in the position of servants. And so they have the opportunity of learning to serve. And instead of... Uh, you know, that's a good that's a good place for those who were the haughty and the mighty and, and, and who dominated uh, to learn how to serve and to perform lowly functions as, as servants. See, we all have to learn to serve. Jesus, uh, there's nothing wrong with being a servant. Jesus came as a servant. He was willing to wash the feet of the disciples. And we need to have that attitude of service. Leadership from God's standpoint is service. And, and there are those uh, whose opinion of themselves and their their status is such that they're going to need the beginning of the millennium to, to uh, in, in the role of servant. Now, obviously, the law of God will be such that uh, uh, to, certainly by the time of the Jubilee, they will, they will go out and will be given back their own land and will have a chance, you see, after they've had a generation or two to, to really learn the lesson and have it impressed, then they'll be to a point where they can be trusted to go back to their land and to be instructed by uh, those of the government of God. God's going to give rest from sorrow and from fear and from hard bondage. 
And now he says, take up a proverb against the king of Babylon. And we come on down here, describes in verse 7, let's just notice, uh, the whole earth is at rest and is quiet. They break forth into singing. That's descriptive of the, of the time of the, of the Messiah, the time of the world tomorrow, a time of a millennial Sabbath. Then in, beginning in verse 12, we have a description of the one who is really the power behind the throne, the ultimate king of Babylon, Lucifer, whose desire was to ascend into heaven and to exalt his throne above the stars of God. He wanted to be like the Most High. You know, Lucifer became Satan. And ultimately, he is the source of all of the problems. Because this satanic attitude is the source. And so this is the basically where we will conclude here in chapter 14. Uh, if I can get some help to pass out the uh, uh, questions on the, chap- on the next set of of Isaiah. We're going to next time uh, cover chapters 15 through 35. So we end up here in chapter 14 with Lucifer desiring to take God's place. And uh, the events that are going to occur. So there's an awful lot packed into the book of Isaiah. An awful lot that that, uh, deals with the things that are going on here and now. God's view of our society, His perspective, and the events that are going to occur immediately ahead and then on beyond that into the world tomorrow. So there's an awful lot that we have yet to uncover as we continue on through the major prophets. I will hope to See you here the next time for that. And then, uh, of course, I'll be seeing most of you, uh, hopefully all of you, on the Sabbath. So, uh, with that, uh, we'll be included here this evening as soon as we finish passing out the questions.